dear Mrs. Schwab, dear Mr. Polman, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the University of Geneva, the Geneva Center for Philanthropy and the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, I want to extend my very warm welcome to all participants to this public conference. This public event closes the first of a two-day international multidisciplinary conference gathering key actors and stakeholders engaged in fostering social entrepreneurship. Geneva is a privileged place for the organization of such a conference, being one of the most important philanthropic hub and the leading center for sustainable finance. The Geneva Center for Philanthropy, created in 2017 by the Rectorate of the University of Geneva, together with a series of high-level foundations, has chosen social entrepreneurship as one of its key research topics under the belief that social entrepreneurship plays a crucial role in pursuing the public good in general and the sustainable development goals in particular, therefore, philanthropic aims. The partnership with the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, a leading global platform that accelerates outstanding models of social innovation, has been instrumental in building a rich and engaging program. The University of Geneva and the Geneva Center for Philanthropy are extremely grateful to the foundation for its engagement. The Schwab has dedicated the past decades to develop a community of social entrepreneurs and give that, them a platform to interact, sharing experiences and gaining higher visibility on the global scene, supporting a more equitable and sustainable world leveraging business principles and the best techniques for the private sector. The University of Geneva, also through the activities carried on by the Geneva School of Economics and Management, is deeply convinced of the responsibility and the role the business plays as key economic and societal actor. We have the privilege to have tonight an outstanding group of speakers the keynote and panel discussion will look at the opportunities offered by social entrepreneurship to serve and support the public good, as well as the role different actors, from individuals to institutions, from public to private, could play to contribute and maximize the impact. Tonight, we also offer the opportunity to award the Foundation Lombardier Prize for Academic Excellence and Philanthropy, jointly established within the University of Geneva, and awarded every two years, the prize aims to encourage research and academic study in philanthropy to ensure transfer of knowledge and to respond to practitioners' needs and to extend, finally, Geneva Reach as a center for excellence in this area. I want to personally thank the Foundation Labara Odier, one of the strategic partners of the Geneva Center for Philanthropy, for its commitment to moving philanthropy forwards and strengthening Geneva position in this sector on the international stage in the tradition and spirit of Geneva. Without any further delay, please allow me to welcome Patrick Odier and Maxime and Martin from the Lombard Odier Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship on stage. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur le Recteur. Dear Henry, dear Hilde, dear Paul, dear guests, it's an honor to be here tonight, and it's my privilege uh, to, tonight to be with you to award the Lombardier Foundation Prize for Excellence in Philanthropy. Uh, my name is Patrick Odier, I'm the senior partner of Lombardier, and I am the president of this foundation. Tonight, we will present the second Lombard Odier Prize for Academic Excellence in Philanthropy together with the Secretary General of the Foundation, Maximilien Martin. Good evening. Ever since its creation, Lombardier has been uh, very, very interested, but also committed uh, on values that have to do with philanthropy. And for example, it is interesting to note in our history that uh, we also could venture in some of what is today called social entrepreneurship pretty early in our history. 
at the creation of the ICRC in uh, 1863, there were certainly a number of funders, but what you probably don't know is that three years before that, Lombardier participated into the first launch of a funding effort to create what became three years later the ICRC. We continue, of course, today to have very, very close relationship with this organization, for instance, with, and of course with many others. Today, we continue that uh, philanthropic tradition in many ways, most notably through La Fondation Lombardier, of course. And in our foundation, we try, to, we try to be innovative when we can, and also be an actor in the fields of humanitarian and specifically education. In recent years, we at Lombardier have decided to go beyond simple monetary support, as we can do, of course, as uh, economic actors, but also as bankers, and to work on strengthening the philanthropic sector itself. Uh, in order to do that, we believe that we can uh, also allow a philanthropist, large or small, professional or otherwise, to maximize the impact of their gifts and achieve their philanthropic ambition. Max? Having a strong and professional sector will also help to further solidify the reputation of philanthropy, topic important currently, and philanthropists as respectable actors actually seek to further the public good. And this enables exactly the kind of collaborative leadership and catalytic philanthropy that I think we'll be discussing later today in the panel segment of this event. Now the prize we're awarding tonight represents another facet of our work at the foundation and is, as Patrick pointed out, to promote philanthropy. And in this case, by incentivizing cutting edge scholarship, we believe that we can generate new insights for governments, philanthropists, foundations, and beneficiaries alike. So the, the topics that we've asked our scholars to focus on for their papers, social entrepreneurship and philanthropy, is a key point of discussion and debate in philanthropic circles and in society, of course, more broadly. In the face of significant challenges like the war, unfortunate war in Europe and climate change, entrepreneurs and consumers are showing increasing interest in adding social and environmental purposes to their business activities. And this is good and has to be encouraged. The most famous example in this trend is the B Corp certification scheme. And Lombardier is particularly proud to have become the, the world's first B Corp certified global wealth and asset manager in 2019. These new socially minded business people are launching commercial activities that in many ways overlap with what might have traditionally been considered a terrain of philanthropist. However, social enterprises seek, and at their core, to make a profit even if they want to promote or advance other causes at the same time. How, therefore, should the law treat social entrepreneurship? Well, given that national contexts are both central to this question and also extremely variable, we decided to take submissions this time in two categories for this year's edition. The first group of papers takes a broad view and focused really on the fundamentals of jurisprudence regarding social enterprises, benefit corporations, and B Corp certification. And a second group focused specifically on the status of purpose-driven companies in particular national contexts. And we had quite a few submissions focusing on a range of countries, including Spain, South Korea, China, Japan, Colombia, and Italy. The best paper in each group will receive a prize of 7,500 Swiss francs. The submission we received from, for the prize have been judged by a jury composed of five members and myself, and I'd like to thank the jury for their time and efforts that they invested in looking at all those uh, papers. We took pain to create a diverse jury. The members have specialist knowledge in the domain of social entrepreneurship as well as practical experience in philanthropic action. The submission we received were generally of an impressively high quality. So we, so we on the jury needed a clear process with which to judge them, of course. We therefore evaluated the submission across six criteria listed, uh, the highest to the lowest weight. Quality of arguments, originality, significance or impact of the study, writing style, excellence bonus, and suitability for publication. It is now my pleasure to announce the winner of the first of the two prizes to be awarded this evening in the category Fundamentals of Jurisprudence Regarding Social Enterprises, Benefit Corporations, and B Corp Certification. The winner is Professor Antonio Ficci of the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, Italy, for his paper entitled Models and Trends of Social Enterprises Regulation in the European Union.
Good morning, a cordial greeting from Rome on a very hot day. First of all, I would like to apologize for not being there with you. Unfortunately, family and work problems prevent me from traveling at this time. I'm very happy for this award. It is a great honor for me. I would like to sincerely thank all those who have made it possible. This prize is for me much more than acknowledgement for a good article. It is the equivalent of a career award, a prize for more than 20 years of research on the law of social enterprise and the third sector. Therefore, I am extremely grateful to the Lombard Odier Foundation, to the members of the jury and its president, Mr. Patrick Odier, who voted in my favor, as well as to my friend, Professor Carlo Vargas, who invited me to participate in the volume, and to its other two editors of the volume, Professor Henry Peter, director of the Geneva Center for Philanthropy, who has orchestrated all this, and the professor and Professor Jaime Alcalde Silva. I truly think that the award is important not because of its recipient, but because it rewards a legal article on social enterprise, an organizational form whose institutional purpose is not the enrichment of a handful of people, but the common good for everyone. We need supports like these to give more and more importance to law as an instrument for enhancing the virtues of the good people and not just for limiting and sanctioning the bad men. This alternative function of law is still poorly understood. Neither the first sector nor the second sector is alone able to promote it. The third sector must do, it, must do, must do this. The third sector that is magnificently represented here by the Lombard Odier Foundation, to which I can guarantee that this award will further contribute to research in this important field. Thanks again and greetings to all. Let me now turn back to our Secretary General, Max, who will announce the winner in the second category. Max. Thank you very much, Patrick. Well, uh, you know, as mentioned, it's about the fundamentals of jurisprudence, but it's also about the national context. And, you know, in the second category, I'm delighted to report that we had a lot of good submissions and papers. However, so much so that it was really difficult to decide on a winner. And so we, uh, you know, we, we had a tie. And being entrepreneurial, we decided to, you know, not penalize someone for being really good and rather give two awards. And we also thought that, you know, you might, I mean, we all enjoy videos, but you might also want to see real people. Um, so we're very happy that the first of the two tied winners of category two, sorry, it sounds a bit convoluted, uh, is actually here with us. And the winner is uh, Dr. Livia Ventura of the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership and also of the Guido Cali Law Department in Rome uh, for the paper title is not really surprising, Social Enterprises and Benefit Corporations in Italy, because that's the national context. Please give a hand to Livia, and Livia, please join us on stage. We're delighted to present you the diploma in person. Thank you so much. Just a few words. Good evening to everyone present here, and of course, it's a huge honor for me to receive this uh, this prize, and uh, I really would like to thank the Fondation Lombardier for the recognition of my, of my work and the Geneva Center for Philanthropy for welcoming me as an academic fellow a few years ago. Thank you so much. Congratulations. So, you know, with the tie and you knowing that it's a national context, you might be starting to guess, so which country do we end up in next? And... Um, the second winner, of, in fact, is, uh, again, the same topic, status of purpose-driven companies in a particular national context. And the production of this research also models this idea of collaborative leadership because we actually have three uh, co-authors, um, and they come from China. Um, it's Professor Meng Zhao of Nanyang Business School of Nanyang Technology University in NTU in Singapore. Um, it's Jian Li of Minju University of China in China, and Kai Yun Chu, a PhD candidate also at the same university, at Minzu University of China. Um, their paper is entitled Social Enterprises and Benefit Corporations in China. And please give them a hand. This is their diploma, the, the certificate. 
And, and while, I have to, while I have to break it to you that they're not here, at least we've done something for the carbon footprint and they were so kind to record a video. Dear professors, dear chairman and members of the jury, it's a great honor to me and my colleagues to receive the Lombard Audio Foundation Prize for Academic Excellence in Philanthropy. We see this as a recognition of the growing globalization of the social enterprise movement and the progress in the public sector around the world to support this movement, including China. We appreciate the leadership of the Geneva Center for Philanthropy in building a special community of global scholars who stride across research, practice, and policy-making areas. And congratulations on the publication of the book. This is much needed to spread the message of where the movement is in reshaping the business world. We are so glad to be part of this project. Thank you. That's clear short video presentation as a paper, ladies and gentlemen. We gave them one minute. They used 58 seconds. <laughs> Thank you once uh, more to all the members of the jury for the time and the thoughtfulness that they put into judging the over 40 uh, submissions that we received. And thank you, of course, to all the authors and contributors for their worthy contributions we had the pleasure of reading and evaluating. It is now time to move to the second phase of our event this evening. And for that, we will hand the floor back to Hilde Schwab, the chairperson and co-founder of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, who will introduce the keynote speaker. Hilde. Thank you. Merci, Patrick. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate the winners. They have done a wonderful job. I was very happy to be present. Um, Professor Flückiger, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi d'être avec vous à l'université ce soir. Et je souhaite la bienvenue à tout le monde. Je vous félicite pour la création du Geneva Center for Philanthropy et j'aimerais remercier le professeur Peter et son équipe pour ce partenariat avec la Schwab Foundation. Il est encourageant que votre université a pris l'initiative il y a quelques années déjà d'inclure l'entrepreneuriat social dans votre curriculum. Nous vivons dans une époque où il est très important d'engager la jeune génération dans la poursuite d'objectifs sociaux et environnementaux. Et je souhaite que nombre d'entre vous ici trouveront leur vocation dans ce secteur. We are very encouraged by the focus of the Geneva Center for Philanthropy on social entrepreneurship as one of its core themes, a topic we have been deeply engaged in for almost 25 years. Uh, together with my husband, Klaus Schwab, we started the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship in 1998. We felt that a distinct, more innovative approach to address social inequality and environmental challenges was emerging. We saw a new generation of pioneers who channeled their passion, resources, creativity, a sense of injustice, and dedicated themselves to finding ways to achieve real change on the grassroots level. For two decades, we have supported the community of social innovators by bringing their work and models to the attention of the global public. We included them in the activities of the World Economic Forum to work together with political and business leaders to find innovative and, above all, practical solutions to the most pressing problems. Over the past two years since COVID pandemic, we have witnessed how their work is more relevant than ever. For example, by bringing quality health care to rural India to combat COVID, or by empowering black local businesses in Brazil to overcome the economic barriers of racial inequality, or by using artificial intelligence and big data to create inclusive education platforms in many countries from South Korea to South Africa. Today, this community comprises over 400 leading social innovators, and our impact studies have shown how over 700 million lives in over 190 countries have been directly been improved, lives have been improved by their work. To be effective, 
The social entrepreneurs often have to navigate institutions, foundations, and investors to find funding and partnerships on their own. That's why the Schwab Foundation also established the Global Alliance for Social Entrepreneurship, bringing together over 100 corporations, international organizations, and foundations to engage private and public sector leaders in support of social entrepreneurship and innovation. As a founding member, we helped launch the new global movement of social entrepreneurs called Catalyst 2030. Its members collectively work to engage the philanthropic sector and the private sector to accelerate progress towards the sustainable development goals and systems change. You will hear more about Catalyst 2030 later from its co-founder and serial social entrepreneur, Chiru Pilimoria. It takes a particular kind of leadership to set a vision and make the bold changes that are needed for a more sustainable world. And I'm delighted that we have one of the world's leading voices here with us this evening as our keynote speaker. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Paul Polman, who works tirelessly to accelerate action by business to achieve the UN Global Goals, which he helped develop. As CEO of Unilever from 2009 to 2019, he demonstrated that a long-term multi-stakeholder model goes hand in hand with excellent financial performance. He has been described by the Financial Times as a standout CEO of the past decade. Paul's new book, Net Positive, is a call to arms to courageous business leaders, setting out how to build net positive companies with profit by fixing the world's problems rather than creating them. Paul, thank you for coming to be with us today. Please join us on stage. Well, when Hilde asks you to come to Geneva and speak, you do it. In fact, you don't have a choice, <laughs> but it's definitely out of respect. And actually, I didn't tell Hilda yet, but we're in the middle of the move in Geneva, so the house is a mess. And I'm actually glad that I could be here with all my friends and talk to you and use this as a good excuse. I'm not sure Kim is very happy that I left the house, but this, I told her this is a much more noble cause. Uh, Colin Meyer is here. Where's Colin? I heard he gave a wonderful speech today, but... He's not here yet. Might see him tonight, my dear friend. Anyway, I want to thank uh, Eve and Hilda, obviously, uh, for putting this together. And then uh, Patrick, again, for the prices and being a B Corps. If anybody wants to do banking, go to OJ. That's, uh, this is an unpaid advertisement. But it's uh, definitely uh, worth doing. And uh, put your money where your mouth is is a good strategy. The uh, thanks to the winners as well, to uh, Livia, Antonio, and the professors, Li Chao and Chu. I thought I'd better do it that way and avoid embarrassment by mispronouncing Chinese names. The um, Swap Foundation, as Hilda said already, is, is just amazing what uh, you have achieved in the last 20 years, not only by yourself, by impacting the 700 million people you talk about and changing their lives. I've always said the true definition of a billionaire is not having a billion in your bank account. That seems to be easy these days, but to really touch a billion people. And you're well on your way to do it. In the last uh, three years, you've added a few hundred million just, and always in the right areas of health or women empowerment or education and all the other things. But I also think that your influence has gone way beyond that, not only in what you do, but actually how you influence others. And, and, um, and set the example. So there's this ripple effect that always is even more important than our own actions itself. And then the University of Geneva, I'm glad that you have the uh, Center of Philanthropy. I'm also glad you have a parking just below here because it's impossible in this city. But um, the uh, partnerships that you're driving, the academic rigor uh, is exactly what is needed. You know, I think the bigger crisis that we have is sometimes not these issues we're going to talk, but the denial of science and having the academic institutions there and being part of that and embedding it in the sustainable development goals, I think is, uh, is incredible. Now, you conceive uh, social 
entrepreneurship as the creation of organizations or ventures, as you call it, seeking to blend an economic activity with social and environmental goals. So that's a pretty broad definition. But actually reading that and reading it twice, I felt, you know, I've been probably myself my whole life a social entrepreneur. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a small company. I've always felt that business should be there to help improve the state of the world, not to make it worse. Although some of them haven't discovered that yet, it is certainly an example that we should aspire to. I also have the benefit of being involved in, in some of our own foundations and having created since my uh, retirement, although I don't use the word retirement, actually I don't like it because it sounds like you were tired and now you're tired again, which isn't very appealing to me. But uh, I've started some other social ventures and I don't envy you because I know how difficult it is to get going on these things, but it's also more important than ever. The, um, uh, the creativity that you bring, the innovations that you bring, uh, the passion that you bring, most importantly, the proximity to what this is all about. It's serving the people out there that otherwise would pay a heavy price for our shortcomings. Uh, that is what you do best, and that is what we need more of. The, uh, I believe Switzerland itself, I've talked it with Patrick at many occasions, you, you have that possibility to be actually that center. What I like in Geneva is everybody is here. And you have the, the proximity and the time uh, to talk to all of these stakeholders. The issues that we have to solve are of such magnitude that nobody can do it alone anymore. It requires these broader partnerships. It requires the financing to flow at the same time. There's no question about it that the governments have run out of money, that more and more needs to come via other means. And Geneva could be a shining example of where not only these dialogues happen, but obviously where the action takes place. And having the World Economic Forum here as an anchor is obviously a head start. We, we saw in the last Economic Forum, again, the, the dominant discussions around the areas that really matter, food and food security, made worse by the terrible war unfolding not far from here in the Ukraine. The burning platform of climate change, I don't have to talk to you about it. But I was also pleased to see that nature is higher on the agenda. Nature itself... 30% of the issue of climate change, uh, only getting about 2% of the global funding. It's also 30% of the solutions. Any dollar invested in nature has probably about an $18 uh, payout, but still we struggle with that. What do science-based targets for nature mean? How do I internalize that into my businesses? Is something very difficult. You know, climate change, it's sort of particles per million that sit in the air. And, and people can understand that, but when it gets to nature, it's a little bit more difficult, but it probably is the most important thing. You know, nature, the, the destruction of nature is actually the issue that we're facing. Climate change is more of a symptom of some of that. COVID, direct result of destruction of nature. One of these other zoonotic diseases like SARS, Ebola, Zika, Asian flu, I don't need to talk to you about that. In fact, the, the a Canadian philosopher, Hubert Reeves, said it very well when he said, man is the most insane species. He worships an invisible God and destroys the visible nature, not realizing that the invisible God, uh, sorry, that the visible nature he destroys. No, let me start again because now I'm mixing up myself. <laughs> man is the most insane species. He worships an invisible God and destroys the visible nature, not realizing that the visible nature he destroys is the invisible God he worships in the first place. And this is exactly what we're doing. And the issues are very clear. If you, I don't need to tell you that our global economic system is broken. We've had a tremendous uh, economic growth since World War II. We've grown 12 times. Population has grown three times. So if you do the calculations, we've gotten four times richer. But that linear extractive production model is coming to an end. I think that if anything, what COVID has learned or taught us, if you want to, is that you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. And you would agree with me that anything you can't do forever is by definition unsustainable. You know, this wonderful world is 4.6 billion years old. If you put it for simplicity on the scale of 46 years, human beings have only been here for four hours. The Industrial Revolution only happened one minute ago. And in that one minute, we've cut down half the world's forests. In the last five decades, we've lost 68% of the world's species, mammals, birds, uh, reptiles, amphibians. When is it our turn? 
Some people call this the sixth greatest extinction. We just announced on Sunday, World Overshoot Day, which is the day that we use up more resources than the planet can replenish. It again came forward to July 28th. I would argue that after that day, every day thereafter, we're actually stealing from future generations. I don't want to be part of that. I know you don't want to be part of that. So we have a job to do. In reality, many people are doing things, but collectively, it doesn't add up. We're simply not doing enough. Nature is calling for it. Science is calling for it. Frankly, all the people are calling for it. The big resignations in the US is a direct result of people looking for companies that have at least a little bit of purpose. And in fact, I also think increasingly we see the financial market moving as we move rapidly from, from risk mitigation in this sense to seizing the opportunities. And obviously some of the governments, unfortunately not enough, are starting to wake up as well to these things. So, you know, some people say, I don't know if we can get there and if we can still stay below one and a half degrees and be in these planetary boundaries. But, you know, my explanation, I got this question at the Hay Festival on Saturday when we were discussing the book. And he said, isn't it too late? And, you know, shouldn't we just go for two degrees and wait, etc.? And I said, you know, if you, if you are a doctor and you work in the emergency room in a hospital and a patient comes in tremendously weak, you know, shows only little signs of life, are you going to say as a doctor, just forget about it? I'm not going to take anybody that comes into the emergency room. No, you're going to give it all. You're just giving anything you can, unselfishly actually, to ensure that the patient survives. We're at that moment now that we need to give it everything in the next 10, 15 years maximum to ensure that we don't have that incredible liability that comes from future generations. And frankly, that we don't have the billions of people then that suffer from our in incompetence. I'm sure we'll be fine and we'll find this little island of prosperity that we can live in, but the sea around us of poverty is increasing at a rapid rate. So I think there are some uh, uh, technologies happening which are obviously good where we see possibilities to be close to tipping points. On energy with solar and wind, there's no question. And how many companies have signed up for the RE100 initiative, which is renewable energy, is quite staggering. We see the same happening in mobility. This year we'll be selling 20 million electric cars. Two, three years ago it was one million. And in fact, we could be selling much more if we wouldn't have the chip shortage. If you look in food, actually, the only part of the food business that is growing and, and, and having a market uh, uh, cap uh, that, uh, that moves up is the organic, is the bio, is the neighborhood, uh, is the regenerative. So these three key uh, systems that we need to transform beyond some other systems, but these three are already close to a tipping point in my opinion. So it can be done if we wanted to. The good thing is when, when COVID started, the question for most, uh, most people's minds was, will we learn the lessons of the past? You know, in the financial market, we missed the opportunity. When that happened in 2008 or 2007, eight, uh, we didn't spend the money on solving the issues of inequality or accelerating our actions towards climate change. In fact, only 5% of the funds went into that direction. We spent all the money actually to build out the financial network, important as it may be, but us, people in the street, felt that banks were too big to fail and people were too small to matter. Especially because we didn't address these issues, we got the populists, the xenophobics, the nationalists in governments. We got this enormous divide that we now see, including at the multilateral institutions or geopolitically. We missed an opportunity. There's no question about that. But COVID, I think that moment of pause that moment of reflection, which is so important in life, has made us realize that things need to be different. And I genuinely believe that it has truly bent the curve of humanity, even though we're still far removed from what science tells us what to do. Before COVID, 20% of the countries had made net zero commitments. Now we have actually 95% of the emissions, 65% of the countries making net zero commitments. Before COVID, we had about 300 companies with science-based targets. Now we have over 3,000 companies with science-based targets. The financial market has woken up. One of the bigger initiatives in Glasgow was the Glasgow 
uh, financial alliance for net zero, $130 trillion of money under management in portfolios, making a commitment to decarbonize their portfolios. From whatever direction we look at, I think we're starting to move at a speed that probably we haven't seen before. Now, despite all of that, and despite, I would argue, Glasgow being a political success, it still is a failure if it doesn't meet the science targets. This decade alone, climate change, we're still projecting a 14% increase when we know we need a 45 to 50% decline. In fact, uh, uh, last week, we hit the uh, 420 parts per million concentration in, in the uh, atmosphere. You have to actually go back to find the same uh, levels of, uh, of concentration. You have to go back 4 million years. And 4 million years ago, the sea levels were 25 meters higher. If this goes on, most of the cities, 80%, which is actually where most of the poor people live and around the coastlines, will be gone. The migration you'll get, the poverty that comes out of that will be tremendous. So climate change, we have a job to do. And the same thing on inequality, by the way. Unfortunately, here with COVID, again, we haven't seen the benefit. The billionaires got more billions. There's no question about that. They had all the benefits of the appreciation, again, of the wealth in the world. Basically, all the government money flowing directly into their wallets, as far as I can see. Some people have a more sophisticated explanation. But that's basically what happened. And many more people pushed into poverty. In fact, the sad part is the sustainable development goals probably have been pushed back 15 to 20 years because of that. And really, have we learned the lessons? I would say no. Uh, again, I was reading this weekend, the, the CEOs of the biggest companies in the world, their average salary increase last year was over 20%. And in fact, the, the companies that did not increase the salaries of their employees, their CEOs had an even higher increase in the salaries. I don't need to repeat that, but it's stunning. We see the companies again collectively uh, taking on corporate debt that is higher than ever. But where does that money go? Not to investing in the people, it goes directly into share buybacks and special dividends to prop up the share price. It's just a Ponzi scheme that we're building in many of these companies. And with that mentality, with that attitude, with that lack of leadership, I would argue, it will be very difficult to reach these targets. Now, most people now know what needs to be done. I, I rarely meet a CEO who says, I want more unemployment, more climate change, or more people going to bed hungry. Fortunately, I haven't met many of them. So somehow, they, they know what needs to be done. But I think, in essence, they struggle with the how to do it. It's not anymore that we need to spend the time on the why, but that we need to spend far more time on helping these companies with the how. And by the way, it is the companies. It's not the governments anymore. Of course, we need governments and, and we need their support. But they are paralyzed beyond belief, and it will not get better in the next five to ten years. And certainly not after the coming U.S. elections and some of the other things and the tension that is there between China and the U.S., the multilateral institutions that don't quite function. I think that pressure has to be built up even more to see substantial changes. So more than ever, it's time for business to de-risk this political process. Business is 65 to 70 percent of the global economy. 85% of the job creation, 95% of the financial flow. We simply can't get to these sustainable development goals if the private sector doesn't get behind it at scale and speed. So the reason I wrote my book was to change our mindsets. Most companies are in what I call the CSR mode. And the book, by the way, is called Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. It's a very difficult concept giving more than you take. But it's probably the only solution to solve our challenges that we have. By the way, in life, where you have your parents or your family or your friends, they are your parents, your family, and your friends because they most likely will give you more than they take. At least my parents did. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here. They gave me education. They gave me food. They gave me housing. They gave me warmth. They gave me values. They were totally concentrated on not having to go through the terrible things that they went through, in their case, the Second World War or other things. Giving more than you take. What we are trying to do here is, is to say, 
uh, most companies in are in what I call the CSR mode, corporate social responsibility. That's how you see most of the uh, CSR reports of companies or sustainability reports talking about a little bit less plastics in the ocean, a little bit less deforestation in my value chain, a little bit less carbon emission. But when we've overshot these planetary boundaries, a little less bad is still bad. I used to kill 10 people, now I'm only killing five people. I'm still a bad murderer. So we need to get out of that mindset that this is good, especially when we've overshot these planetary boundaries. Okay, okay, I get it, Paul, I get it. I want to be sustainable. But what is sustainable? No harm, neither good nor bad. The word sustain, maintain. It's interesting because 95% of the people don't want to maintain what we have because they know it's not working. So the only thing that counts, frankly, is to think regenerative, restorative, reparative. And that's what we call net positive. Net positive companies taking responsibility of their total handprint in society. All of their consequences, intended or not. Many companies think they can outsource their value chain and by doing so, also outsource their responsibilities. It doesn't work anymore. Undoubtedly, Facebook type companies, if I pick one, and it's good to pick on them because everybody seems to pick on them, but it's actually they might have some benefits. That's why so many people are using their platforms. But if they don't take responsibility, let's say on child addiction or undermining democracy or, or hate speech on their platforms, then they're not taking their responsibilities. A net positive company optimizes the return for all of its stakeholders. It knows that it needs to solve these burning issues that are longer term issues to solve. If it's longer term, by definition, you're talking sustainable. By definition, you're talking multiple stakeholders. A net positive company sees the shareholder return as a result of what you do, not as a myoptic objective. Of course we need profits. I'm not stupid either. But profits is a little bit like white blood cells in your body. We need white blood cells to live. But how many of you live for white blood cells? Ah, did you hear? My day was so good, I had more white blood cells than you. No. And it's the same with profit. Profit should be a result of what we do. And, and by the way, a very noble thing to have to ensure that you can continue doing it. And then a net positive company is a company that actually works on the broader transformations that we need in society. Sys driving changes in a system that is not anymore designed to deliver is becoming, uh, becoming uh, lunacy. Uh, optimizing on something that isn't designed anymore will not give us the results. And that is what we're currently doing. So you need these broader partnerships with governments, with civil society, with the social sector and all others to come together to move these boundaries so behavior starts to change, to drive these broader systems changes. So the, um, anyway, read the book. What I like about it, by the way, is the, deliberately I took the word uh, co uh, courageous because it comes from the French word cur, which is heart. We need to bring humanity back to business. Anything that goes through the heart goes to the brain. Anything that just comes in the brain goes out again. And it's about that courage, the courage to take responsibility for your total impact in the world, the courage to set targets that are really needed versus targets you can get away with. The courage to actually work together with others in partnerships that you haven't done before, where sometimes the inconvenient truth needs to be dealt with. Dealt with. A courage to work with governments and others to drive these broader transformational changes. Now, even Martin Wolf, who has not been my friend for a long time, I think he had a hard time understanding that business was more than making money, but now he's actually seen the light. It was very good in his last column in the Financial Times, which uh, typically in Martin Wolf's style, he claims as the product of his own intelligence, that he actually literally takes from our book um, what uh, the role of the companies should be. And he's asking himself the questions. You know, he says very clearly, um, let me get it here, because this one I wrote down because I thought it was... Um, you know, the best compliment we could get perhaps is the way to look at it, you know, but he says, he would suggest that business leaders engage with, uh, he, he calls it, he was written it, writing it for the World Economic Forum actually, I see now, and they should ask themselves, should, uh, what am I as an influential individual or business leader and member of business organizations, what am I doing? What am I doing to increase the capacity of my country and the world? 
Am I prepared to take taxes? Do I support laws that will bring accountability to rogue business organizations and leaders? Do I strengthen the political system on which the collective success uh, uh, depends? So it's this consistency that is important that we talk about in our book. It doesn't serve anything to make big climate change targets and then have your trade associations lobby the other way. It doesn't serve anything to, think, to say that you like democracy to be there when a terrible January 6 event happened in Washington, but then spend four and a half billion dollars collectively in, in politics to influence the outcomes of what supposedly is a democratic process or should be a democratic process. It so doesn't serve anything if you belong to the 30 of the 500 biggest companies that have never paid tax and claim to have such a big purpose. We need to be consistent in all we do. And that's part of what we talk about in this book, uh, Net Positive. Let me um, briefly, I get the sign here, so let me briefly um, uh, wrap up. You know, I think at the end of the day, I don't think that this is a crisis of climate change, of food security, or inequality. I think this is a crisis of greed, of apathy, of selfishness. And ultimately, we have the solutions. It's nice to have some more technology, but it will always be. But we have the solutions. We know how to build houses, yet the number of homeless go up. We know how to build toilets, yet there's one and a half billion people still open defecating. In fact, we also know how to make food and produce food in a sustainable way without cutting down the forests, yet we seem to neglect them. We know what we need to do. What we've seen is clearly during COVID, a bifurcation of business models where the longer term multi-stakeholder business models were doing better versus the rest, but we've also seen a bifurcation in leadership where leaders that had a certain level of humanity, humility, worked in partnership, were more purpose-driven, thought multi-generational, these were the leaders that instilled the trust and actually their organizations went the extra mile during what undoubtedly have been very difficult and challenging times. So ultimately it's the leadership that is needed. I, the, the, I wanted to end actually with two sentences on philanthropy because it is an important thing. And there's a, a, a big change happening in philanthropy, uh, especially now that you have so few people with such an enormous amount of wealth. In fact, the few billionaires that we have have about $13 trillion of money under management. The $13 trillion alone, or the increases that they get every year that we saw during COVID as well, would pay for education for everybody, would ensure that nobody goes to bed hungry, would provide health care for everybody. So if we could get that money directed towards the sustainable development goals, it is more than you would ever get from any government in the history of mankind. So they do increasingly play an important role. And to some extent, because that money is so concentrated, you can actually do more with it and bigger and faster if you wanted to do so. We created, I'm on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation, we created the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, where we want to give the 800 million people that don't have access to energy, green energy, and stop the energy poverty. With 500, with 500 million from Jeff Bezos, 500 million from IKEA, 500 million from the Rockefeller Foundation, we've come to about 10 billion. The 10 billion will leverage up to about 100, 120 billion if you do blended financing, if you understand that. That alone would be enough to solve the energy poverty for those people. These are the bigger projects that we need. So we see wealth transfer to a more purpose-driven generation is a big trend. We see deeper involvement uh, of the philanthropy is a big trend. We see more of a demand for these solutions-based approaches and a willingness to go with partnership. Obviously, impact and getting results is a terribly important way. And then we see it, politicization, obviously, is a very uh, dangerous part of philanthropy. That Whatever people do, uh, I think you'll get more uh, uh, public scrutiny and need to think about that. This whole debate in the US right, for example, on woke capitalism and ESG being baloney is a very dangerous thing that is happening and the high net worth individuals and the philanthropists probably get more of the brunt for that. Anyway, I do want to thank the philanthropists and their generosity, but I do want to tell them something. They're actually not so generous. They're giving away 1.2% of their wealth on average every year, whilst their wealth increases by 10% every year. That's not philanthropy. 
That's not philanthropy to me. The first question you have to ask if you're a philanthropist and you have that money, how did you earn the money? Did you earn the money by making this wealth better, by solving the world's problems, or by creating the world's problems? If you earn that money by creating the world's problems, you probably cause more damage than you gained yourself. You might get that money, but you cause more damage to the world. Question number one. Question number two, if you have that money, good for you, but how do you invest it? Are you investing it with JP Morgan, who is the biggest lender to call, or are you investing it in a B Corp like, like uh, Patrick sitting here? It's a very important thing, because I ask all of them, how do you invest your money? And they seem to be bifurcated in their minds. It's okay to earn a lot more money with private equity and whatever you have, but then we'll give away something. No, how do you invest your money? It has a bigger effect than the money you give away. And then, uh, finally, if uh, on, on, on the uh, philanthropist together, is, um, is how you actually uh, work together as philanthropists to solve these bigger problems becomes the most important thing with the time and speed that we have. So let me thank you. Let me thank you for what you are doing. Let me thank you for keeping this not only high on the agenda, but getting others uh, actively involved in it. I think with the book Net Positive, your work that you're doing, we, we have this mindset now of uh, hopefully of enough people to drive critical mass. It doesn't need everybody, but it needs about 15 to 20 percent of people. Uh, if you don't participate or if you give up or if you give in, I think you'd agree with me, you'd become part of the problem. Uh, the future of capitalism, the future of humanity now uh, depends on it. And I think we don't have a choice but to move forward at the speed and scale that this demands. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for what you're doing. And good luck on your journey. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, you have set the scene for our, our panel discussion. I'm Francois Bonici, I'm the director of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. And uh, I think without further ado, I'm going to invite our, our wonderful panel onto the stage uh, and as I set us up for this conversation. Uh, Professor Flukiger, thank you so much uh, for, ha for having us here. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, the only other time uh, I, I was actually on the stage with Paul Palman was, please take a seat anyway. The only other time I was on the stage with Paul Palman was actually virtually. My book was above his on Amazon, <laughs> just for a week or two, and then he knocked me uh, right off. Uh, but definitely uh, worth a read, and, and thank you again for coming all the way uh, to, to help us this evening. Um, it's really uh, a pleasure uh, to, to have this esteemed panel that I'll introduce very uh, shortly. I wanted to uh, throw away all my notes uh, and, and come to uh, three things that uh, uh, Paul mentioned. Greed, apathy, uh, and selfishness. And if you wanted a definition, or th throw out all the other definitions around social entrepreneurship and speak about the opposite of those. Uh, selflessness, courage that he spoke about, ambition, a refusal to accept the status quo for what it is, uh, and innovation, of course. And so while you painted quite a scary picture about where we are right now, the fact that our systems that we've built do not serve us uh, in many ways, uh, that can be quite paralyzing. Uh, and I think what we have in the field of social entrepreneurship and in this partnership with philanthropy over the last couple of decades is uh, a demonstration um, demonstrable uh, proof that we actually have the solutions and we have the innate ability to do the things that need to be done. Uh, what we have is also a set of amazing leaders, right? And so while social entrepreneurship may have been thought of something that was niche, uh, it is no longer niche. Uh, I, I wrote the forward for a recent report uh, on the state of global social enterprise that was released this week and called it one of the greatest movements of our time that doesn't have a name, doesn't have a face yet, uh, but it has uh, many, many leaders in a very distributed way. Uh, we also released at the World Economic Forum just two weeks ago uh, a, a session and a report on unlocking the social economy. Where we have data, we know that this is now a significant sector. Uh, 2.8 million social enterprises in Europe 13 million people employed, 
up to 7% of GDP uh, and 9% of employment in some countries. This is no longer a niche. This is now becoming uh, a significant sector, but also importantly, uh, the kinds of questions that I think that business are asking and governments are asking, there is an opportunity to really integrate and, le and learn the lessons from what we've uh, experienced with social entrepreneurship over the last couple of decades. It's a privilege for me uh, to be here uh, in Geneva and to uh, introduce uh, all of you and to sit on the stage with really some, some pioneers who, who do have these values of, of courage, of ambition, uh, of innovation and of selflessness. Um, so perhaps I'll start you know, next to me over here. You've already met uh, Patrick Audier, the managing partner of Lombard Audier Group and uh, president of uh, Fondation Lombard Audier and also the president of uh, Swiss Sustainable Finance. Um, uh, next to him, Jeru Bilamoria, co-founder of the One Family Foundation and Catalyst 2030, serial social entrepreneur, as Mrs. Schwab had pointed out. Uh, uh, dear friend Olivia Leland, uh, uh, founder and chief executive offer, officer of CoImpact, a, a pioneer in philanthropy that we'll hear more about, and Alberto Alemano, a professor of European Union law at HEC, a uh, social entrepreneur as well and founder of the Good Lobby. Uh, perhaps I'll uh, start, Jeru, with you, and I'm just going to ask each of them to, instead of telling them uh, their whole bio, ask them to, to give a short introduction of I guess their life's work and what's brought them to, to today. Uh, but tell us a little bit about yourself, Jeru, and, 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 and what you've done uh, as a short, introdu short introduction. Well, as you said, sorry, I have to take the mic. Here. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks for us. Thanks, Francois. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm a social entrepreneur. I've been at this from a very, very young age. Um, but I've started multiple social enterprises, nine of them. Uh, started my first one when I was 16, and the latest one is Catalyst, which actually Hilda played a very, very key role in co-founding. I do want to give a story instead of just talking about all the enterprises, is I started one of my first enterprises, Childline, when I was in India. Fell in love with a Dutchman, moved to the Netherlands, and I knew nobody. And actually it was the Schwab Foundation which provided a lot of support in helping and scaling something in India which was at that time in India and taking us to 167 countries because what the foundation provided, in addition to the recognition which came, was the linkages to key stakeholders, to ITU over here in Geneva, uh, to, be able, to be able to shift policy worldwide. So I do think government plays a key role because when we shifted policy, we were also able to shift corporates because they were forced to then start giving free phone numbers for children. And that led us to be able to helping, receiving over 100 million calls that we've received since we started GHI, and helping directly more than 10 million children. So I'm saying this because of the important thing that when you start an enterprise, it can be an idea, but when you have something like the Schwab Foundation or philanthropy, it is very catalytic and it can help us grow. So in addition to child helpline, there was Aflatoon, which shifted policies in 86 countries where financial inclusion was then made mainstream. And then moving from that, I think the most important is Catalyst, which is why I'm here, which you all talked about. You know, you talked about it. Individually, maybe we can't do enough. But there are several entrepreneurs in this room who are sitting. Lavuyo, Megan, Neelam, who are sitting. Paolo, academics who all decided, Francois, he was pretty much one of the first people I spoke to, who said, we are not going to be individuals. What we do individually is this much. But if we do it together, our collective impact can be much more. And just the entrepreneurs in the Schwab community reach over 2 billion people. That's 1,500 entrepreneurs reaching over 2 billion people. And together, in the last two years, they've started over 80 projects to be able to take it through. So I think the collective positive impact and change that can happen is really, really big. And that's what it's all about. Collective change, impact, and then we have the support. So we are able to make it happen. This is it in a nutshell, sorry. Thank you, Jeru, perfect. Uh, Olivia, I'm gonna to come to you next. You know, this is obviously the theme of social entrepreneurship and philanthropy, you've been on the forefront. Tell us a bit about kind of your journey towards co-impact. Sure. So um, thanks, Francois, and I'm delighted to be here with all of you um, and this great panel as well. Um, 
because actually this topic is something that I am rather preoccupied with, so around both philanthropy and social entrepreneurship. I will not give my full life story because we're between you and dinner and things, um, but I will say I, um, I'm also really focused on this question of collective impact. So the organization that I run, Co-Impact, has it in its name. It is about collaboration and impact. And back in 2014, I had been the founding director of the Giving Pledge, which is an effort uh, that is about encouraging um, people with significant wealth, so mostly billionaires, to give away half of their wealth to philanthropy. And I felt like there was this question I kept having of amongst the group of those who had taken the Giving Pledge and others, what more could we do to really encourage not just the amount, but also the what of philanthropy? So what it is that philanthropy is actually going towards so that we can see the impact that we've been talking about all evening. And so I uh, actually spent about three years going and interviewing social change leaders, so social entrepreneurs, academics, activists, others from around the world, saying, what would be your dream for philanthropy? What is it that you really think that philanthropy could do to have more impact in the world? And that's how the idea for Co-Impact came about. Uh, so we launched back in 2017. We have, we're basically a, a we, we have two pooled funds, so we're a collaborative of both philanthropists and foundations, as well as social change leaders, as well as um, advisors that we have uh, in many of the countries where we work, all coming together to uh, basically make grants that are about ad advancing systems change. And in the two funds, one is around advancing systems change in education, health, and economic opportunity. Uh, and the other one is um, on advancing gender equality and women's leadership. And they're actually quite related because when we talk about trying to shift systems, we have to remember who it is that we're actually, who's actually in the system. And so actually really focusing deeply on equity within everything we do is so crucial. And Paul talked about leadership. We actually need to look at who our leaders are and be focused on that at every single table, whether it's at the household, the community, uh, at the highest national level throughout our society. And so that's our focus, which is really around what can philanthropy do to support those leaders that are really working to try to shift systems to be more effective, yes, and to be also more just. And I can share more about that, but that's uh, the core of what we do. Thanks. Patrick, uh, you play you know, both on the foundation side as well as obviously this uh, long uh, family uh, history of uh, wealth management and, and banking. Share us a little bit about your journey and kind of why you do the work you do now. I think that we're lucky enough to have a company, an enterprise actually, that is celebrating its 226th birthday in about a week. And that means that we are able to learn a number of lessons that have been uh, given by our predecessors. There are at least four elements on which I think we're trying and I'm trying to focus today in, in this area of uh, uh, philanthropy and perhaps sustainable investing, which uh, have bridges between each other. One is what is really the demand for philanthropic services, what is the demand for philanthropic capital, and what is the demand for sustainable investing. Listening actually to the consumer, if you wish, of our end of the business, i.e. our clients, whether the private clients, families, entrepreneurs that want to return, uh, some of the successes that they've made, or the more in institutionalized clients, the big pension funds or the big foundations, which we heard about, constitute a huge pool of money that can have a huge impact from a volume point of view. Second, I'm trying to also to make sure that we take the initiative rather than let anyone else take it, i.e. in the field of trying to have impact, I think the best way to do it is to demonstrate and, and ensure the proof of concept rather than wait for constraints coming from the politicians, the regulators, or anyone else to tell you how to do it. Just a little parenthesis. I'm lucky enough to, to live on a farm. If I'm trying to apply my vision of how to produce and or exploit land properly in this country, it will probably, I'll be probably one of the minority who is able to do it because of the cost that this implies, i.e. the normative system has to be still completely changed. And I think you can do that if you talk to the regulators and if you talk to the politicians in a way that will make 
those bridges possible between philanthropic or sustainable capital and the causes for society that needs to be pushed. Third, we, we're, we, we're living in a world for the last 200 years also, but we're living in a world that has accelerated in terms of progress and innovation. 25% of our staff is working in technology. These people are looking for new solutions for the businesses, whatever they are, for the analytics, for the measurements uh, of what they're doing, the impact. Why not use also a little bit of what we do and we can do in order to foster technology that can speed up the change and perhaps speed up impact? And uh, for us, we are, you know, we are somehow the agent for change with capital being one of the two production factors that will make the difference for any enterprise. The other one's been labor. So we're trying to use capital in a way that will have, of course, an impact for those who uh, capital belongs to, but also an impact on the destination in which this capital has been invested. So if you combine those uh, four dimensions, I think it is probably the good summary of where we stand and what I'm trying to do today in this field of impact and sustainability investing. Oh. Uh, Alberto, uh, increasingly, uh, you know, the, the work of uh, social entrepreneurs is, is looking at uh, the work of governments. So, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we, we saw social entrepreneurs working in spite of governments. We heard this today earlier, filling the gaps because, you know, fixing problems that are there, fixing problems that markets, where markets have failed, but increasingly we're recognizing that, you know, that these are not uh, sole actors. Tell us a bit about Kind of your work both at HSC and the Good Lobby. Thank you, François. Bonsoir. Bonsoir à tout le monde. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, it works now. Um, well, my story is a story of academic entrepreneurship. Um, I'm an academic. I've been doing my journey, writing my PhD, writing scientific articles for many years. I got tenure, and then I asked myself, so what? The average number of people reading my papers is around 12. 12 people read my papers. <laughs> which is great if I'm lucky I get a CEO reading my paper or the prime minister or somebody getting my idea and translating it into reality. Um, it doesn't really happen. So I really try to think hard about how me and thousands of other researchers could potentially be useful to our society. And since I teach government and law, I said, well, perhaps what is really uh, the stumbling block in progress, what is holding us from making progress is the way in which we make policies. If you think about the policy process, if you think about the interests, the voices that inform decision makers are the usual suspects. We don't have diversity of voices. We don't have all the stakeholders uh, seated around the table. So I start wondering, how can we enrich the policy conversation by ensuring equality of access uh, by decision makers? How can we help the politicians to take better decisions, evidence-based decisions that actually do justice to this. And we just heard from Paul Polman, today we really see a pathological situation. We see not only that the interest of those companies are always there in front of decision makers, but we also see this kind of lobby washing. On the one hand, they say to become greener and more social, but on the other hand, they are lobbying against the adoption of stricter standards on social and the environment. So this is becoming very nasty. So what can we do about it? Well, there are different ways, different approaches uh, we can take. And I think over time, what we prove possible is to connect the skills that many professionals do have. They can be lawyers, accountants, bankers, public affairs professionals with nonprofit organizations, foundations, and social entrepreneurs in order to have them better represented in the policy process. What a paradox. Those actors who are the most affected by policy, shaping our lives, are actually those people who are not in the room. What a paradox. The social entrepreneurs who actually have the solutions that the policy makers should somehow copy paste in their policies are not into the room. So how can we make this happen? Two major activities. The first one is to enhance the advocacy capacity of nonprofit organization by leveraging on philanthropic institution, helping us to incubate, create these kind of pro bono opportunities by matching those who have the skills with those who have the need and they actually have those solutions. And the second one, uh, which is slightly more, I would say, systematic in nature, is trying to make more responsible the lobbying that is done by companies. So this is called net advocacy in, in the book we just heard about by Mr. Polman. I call it good lobbying. You could call it corporate political responsibility. 
you can pick your level. But basically, it's about exercising self-restraint. If I'm a big company, I show up in front of the decision makers, and there's no other interest there, I won't be lobbying. I shouldn't be lobbying, because my license to operate might actually be withdrawn at some point. I'm going to lose credibility. And we see this happening. ESG rating, sustainability frameworks are already gathering all this information and sh repackaging this information to the investors so that the investors realize that there is a misalignment between basically what these companies say and what they lobby for. So there is a good lobby movement that is emerging. We are giving our contribution as a small nonprofit to connect the dots. And I think we can count on many allies, many unconventional allies, philanthropies, major investors, progressive companies and entrepreneurs who realize that the policy space is key. This is the root cause of what's wrong, but is also paradoxically what is going to enable us to actually make progress because we got the root causes. If we get the policy rights, we're going to increase the life chances of many more people, increasing the opportunities we have as a society and advance the kind of fight we keep seeing in the horizon, you know, climate inaction all the way to social justice. And now we expect corporations to actually do much more on those issues. So the spotlight is on them and therefore we should keep this kind of watchdogging activity all together and social entrepreneurs, needless to say, are very well placed to play such a role. Thanks so much, uh, Alberto. Uh, I think what we're also seeing, while quite a disparate uh, group of people, actually is a huge convergence happening in the world, right? From what Paul spoke about to kind of the ideas that ha have been driving philanthropy and social entrepreneurship to uh, both what kind of Patrick has spoken about uh, and Alberto uh, in policy making, there's a clear sense that everyone in this room knows kind of, you know, what we're trying to achieve, right? But as, as Paul had spoken to us, we're somehow limited by what we've built and what we're all trying to do is actually work on different parts of that same system uh, to, to, get, to get there. Um, I want to come back to this relationship between social entrepreneurship and philanthropy and, and, and go back in the past a bit and, and recognize that was quite a transactional relationship. Uh, and the field of social entrepreneurship for some time has been trying to create its own identity, speak about what it's doing to the world, recognize individual models, demonstrate different solutions. Uh, and that interaction with philanthropy was about funding ideas, funding scale, funding individual organizations. And I think we're beyond that point now. Right? And, and I want to ask both you, uh, Drew and, and, and Olivia, about that relationship and where you see that heading now more as partners. And I think, uh, Drew, maybe you can speak a bit about you know, Catalyst's work and what they feel they need from the philanthropic sector, the fact that you know, you know, no longer is it only us giving you awards around how good your organizations are, you're starting to reward good behaviors around others. So speak to us a bit about that relationship with philanthropy and, and where that needs to go. Yeah, so I think in that there are three or four, oh, sorry. Thanks. Sorry. I think in that there are three or four things. Initially, like you said, philanthropy was very much I give, uh, or rather, you know, the charity perspective which is there. What social entrepreneurs are pushing for is philanthropy with a difference. Philanthropy with a difference in quite a few ways. I think first is rather than having this very hierarchical relationship in philanthropy, where one person controls the power and says we have to give. Sorry, I'm being a bit blunt here, so apologies. But, you know, so instead of having this hierarchical relationship, we are saying can't we have a relationship of two equals? When you go to private venture, you know, when there is private equity or there's venture capital or whatever, the relationship is much more of an equal nature. So I think what Catalyst is talking about is when we go to a foundation or when we work with philanthropy, can we work shoulder to shoulder as equals to bring about the change that we need to see? In a sense, the Schwab Foundation did that historically because it leveraged its own contacts. It's leveraged the network contacts to make it happen. So A, we are saying, can philanthropy work with us as equals, leverage their network to be able to accelerate the change that we want to see? So I think that is the first philanthropic shift that we are asking. The second philanthropic shift that we are asking is can philanthropists move away from transactions to much more of a trust-based philanthropy where believe in the entrepreneur and let the entrepreneur go, just support the entrepreneur to make the change happen. So we are talking, so when you give a grant, don't give a one-year grant, give multi-year unrestricted funding. 
bit like what you all are doing. So people can really grow. Look at philanthropy in terms of shaping, where the learning which is shaping, because not everybody knows everything. Mistakes happen. Systems change. Francoise, you've written it in your book. Systems work, systems change takes years to happen. So trust the entrepreneur to take that change over a long period of time. So I think that's something which we are also looking at. So when we give the awards, we give awards for philanthropy, which is based on learning with us. It's based on looking at how you can collaborate with us, looking at all of these aspects, how you can trust us. So that is one big shift, we think. We also recognize that philanthropic funding is actually the key critical catalytic funding to bring, about the last, uh, to bring about the large change. So here I'll give a concrete example. Again, I'll just talk about with Chai Lang and with Aflatu. Philanthropic funding which gave one million was able to catalyze 100 million. That's a very good return on investment, right? So that's the sort of funding philanthropic funding can help with. That's, and that can help if you're working on systems change related work or you're investing in the entrepreneur in the right way. So that's the other thing. And the last part in philanthropic funding is actually trying to support proximate leaders, supporting entrepreneurs at the local level and not just investing in large organizations, large international organizations. Because over here in the audience, we have Lavuya, we have Neelam who are sitting. They know the context, they know what has to happen at the field level. Megan's there all the time. Support the leader at the level. They know what is happening, they know the community. And then if you do that, we can really bring about the change because these leaders work together. And together, collectively, we can accelerate it. So these would be my messages on how we are looking at it. And there's actually a letter which all the entrepreneurs have written together. So we can also share that with everyone. Thanks, Drew. Um, which, yes, indeed, which we've signed. Uh, so all of you um, signed too. Um, so the... Um, it's interesting actually listening to you because I, we, we didn't talk before as to what we were going to say, but perhaps not all that surprisingly. Um, I, I mean, I, the, the, the message around trust, the message around power, the message around the focus on systems, which I'll come back to in a second, and the message on supporting proximate leaders, I would say yes, yes, yes to all of those. Um, so, um, Rather than going, I once heard a joke, which was the um, that it has not, nothing has been said until everybody has said it. Um, so I won't repeat the same things that you said and just say that I I, I agree. Um, and I'll add a few things. So one thing I'll add is this move towards collaboration. What you often hear in funder circles is the importance of the organizations that are being funded needing to collaborate with one another, and. One of the things that I believe deeply is that in order to have collaboration, that needs to go for everyone. And so a collaboration shouldn't be, I'm the funder and therefore you go collaborate. It, there needs to be collaboration amongst funders. There needs to be supporting the support that actually happens. Yes, absolutely, it should be towards collaborations and not just individual organizations. But it is this collective action that we're all talking about. And I think that is so crucial. And one of the things that I also think is important is when we think about the collaboration, it's Who's at that table? How are you thinking about that? Because that's actually how change happens, which is actually maybe some unlikely partnerships as well. Um, and also making, be, being conscious about making sure that when you're, you, you're developing the collaborative that you're thinking about who else you, know, might, you might not have thought of that you actually need to. And, and by one of the things with CoImpact that we've th thought a lot about is you know, what's our voice and then where else can we actually maybe you know, share voice with others as well as we think about things. The other piece I will say is also, um, we've, so uh, one of the things I didn't mention is CoImpact is, is a collaborative of, of, of 
of all these different actors, and we bring funders together from around the world. One of the things I'm most excited about as well is that we really have a very global group of funders of both philanthropists and foundations and corporates coming together in this way, saying, now is the time for us to work on philanthropy in this way that is really focusing on systems, it's focusing on justice, it's focusing um, on these outcomes that we're talking about. And so, um, so I do think this collaboration point. The second thing I wanted to mention was on to the systems piece that you talked about, Jeru. I think we're not quite as there yet as we would like to be. So I think, yes, there is a move. I remember I used to say, when I started Co-Impact, I used to say, you know, I'd go to these conferences and we'd be talking about systems change, and then you'd look around and say, well, who's, who's funding systems change? And so one of the things we actually wanted to do was, with Co-Impact, actually support efforts that really are about that, because anyone that you talk to who is actually running an organization or almost anyone, is not going to say, how am I actually scaling my organization and getting it to be bigger? They're actually going to say, how am I actually solving the problem at scale? And when we talk about systems change, that's what this is. It's about how are we solving the problem at scale with equity at the core, right? So it's also, it's not just about numbers, it's about who's in the system. And then it's about actually how can philanthropy support some of the things you've been talking about around how do you get the, the support for the organizations that are actually working with government. And that is also how philanthropy is a tiny drop in the bucket, even if you actually you know, look at the numbers we're talking about, and certainly with how much is moving today. So in order to make it have the most impact, it's about supporting those organizations that are saying, how do we shift you know, billions in government budgets, in market systems, in order to make them more effective and more just? Those would be the two things I'd, I'd add, and here, here to everything you said. Yeah, perfect. And uh, exactly on that point, Patrick, perhaps you, you like to come in, because it is just a drop in the ocean. Right, philanthropy, and obviously you have the, the, the foundation, but really the, 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 the big lever uh, are the capital markets. I mean, there's the 13 trillion of, of, you know, of, of billionaires that could be philanthropy, and if we get them all to join your effort, uh, Olivia, but even so, capital markets are, are, are way bigger. So where, where, you know, where is the bridge, where is the bridging role that you know, social entrepreneurs and, uh, and philanthropy could play in leveraging that in addition to I think the work that's, that's, that's emerging that obviously you're helping to pioneer uh, in, in getting capital markets to be uh, being part of the, you know, solving the challenges as opposed to creating them. I think uh, the means and the resources uh, are not the issue. I think uh, indeed some are more sizable, some aspects are more sizable than others. Um, Foundations today represent probably less than 1% of total investable assets globally. And if it is the case, it doesn't mean that it is small. It's huge, actually. It's, uh, uh, it's already capital to be put at use correctly, and one way to do it correctly is to consider that philanthropy can be a catalyst, as we just heard. It can be the start of a process that will be then put to society as being important for more than simply the destination it was founded for, and then taken over, whether by private capital, or by public capital, or by blended capital. And that's where we, we're trying to, to see the, the bridges to be built. And in order to do that, as I mentioned before, you have to realize that you need, you need a mix of not only capital sources, but also of public and private initiatives. And today, frankly speaking, if I may, the, the wonderful nature of social entrepreneurship is today even more wonderful because the most difficult aspect to deal with today in what we call the sustainable transition is precisely this social aspect. And if you talk to venture capitalists today, you start to see, I'm talking the, to the venture, about the venture capitalists and not the philanthropists, if you talk about the venture capitalists, you start this aspect becoming core to their thinking, i.e. they're coming your way. See what, what, where the, 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 perhaps the more hardcore venture capitalists looking for return short term are starting to think about, hey, what, what could be the best applicable ideas to the largest scope of society that I can contribute to develop? And I think this is where I think the financial sector in general should be helpful. And I think also that's where uh, the public sector and the authorities can be helpful. Actually, if you look at some of the reasons why we have to talk about that, philanthropy has always existed and you will always have people that will want to give back for one reason or another. But one of the reasons is that the, the markets have failed in some big issues. 
And, if the, and I think Paul was probably mentioning that somehow also during his speech. The, the market has failed, so it means that capital has to realize that alone it cannot do it. And if it cannot do it alone, it has to uh, come into collaborative schemes with entrepreneurs that will become social entrepreneurs or sustainable entrepreneurs or humanitarian entrepreneurs or educational entrepreneurs. And capital be can become sustainable capital, humanitarian capital, educational capital, or health capital. And I think if we are trying to bridge these, these different, uh, uh, I would say, steps that capital can have in making a project a succe success, I think we will, we will come to much more interesting solutions in the future. That's, I think, what is happening today. And what we haven't fully explored is at the same time, I guess over the last couple of decades, there have been all these innovations, not only in on the social enterprise side, but on the capitals, right? right? Around innovative finance, social finance, impact investing. We haven't even delved into that. Uh, but I guess all of those have been, in a way, um, you know, experiments and demonstrations of what might be possible, right? You wanted uh, to comment on that? Yeah, I, I can comment on that. I think, you know, you have to take everyone for what he can contribute. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you are interested in a, in a cause that has to do with education, you're going to talk, even if you're the best capitalist, the smarter investor, you're going to want to talk to those who know about education. And same thing in every cause. And I think this is, this is where we have to work. Because our experience has been that practically every good project that was brought by any organization that has uh, the mastery of the fields in which it is active has been success successful in raising capital. Finding an instrument for financing, um, um, you know, uh, uh, facilities in Africa to treat, uh, um, to treat patients that otherwise would be uh, transported at high cost to Europe and for a minority of them through organizations that are specializing in treating that type of disease in that type of region can lead very quickly to the definitions of big pool of monies that can be invested into those projects. It has a social impact. The next step will be how do you make it tradable so that anyone interested anywhere could associate him or herself to that kind of objective. So I think it's not today an issue about how to find enough capital, it's an issue of how to leverage this capital more globally, and that's where I think, personally, technology will help. Make, it, make some project, impact project or social entrepreneurship project, available to a much wider source of capital than it is today, just by making it more liquid or available or tradable or cost effective or safer or controllable by way of technology. Uh, Alberto, um, you know, a lot came up around co collaboration uh, and uh, Patrick has just mentioned, you know, it's many of these kind of sustainable investment uh, or even philanthropic work needs to have public-private partnerships, right? You know, the, the, I know having worked with social entrepreneurs for more than 20 years, Government is usually headache number one <laughs> when, when thinking about the, the, the work they're trying to scale, the, the, the systems they're trying to change. Um, uh, you, know, it, it's, you know, it's often like, how do we find the resources, but then really to do this kind of work, we can't do it alone, right? Uh, and, and kind of Paul mentioned clearly the role of private sector, but I don't think we've fully unpacked the role and the importance of public sector, and obviously that is different in different parts of the world, and we're kind of, Paul also referred to the kind of where we are right now, kind of politically, geopolitically, uh, and you know, we cannot ignore uh, and continue to work uh, in spite of governments. So mm. tell us a little bit around kind of how you think this relationship between social entrepreneurship and philanthropy can really work kind of more effectively with government to do these kind of more systemic changes that, that are needed. Yeah, the, the sense I, I gather from our conversation is that the elephant in the room is a bit the government the inability of government to design policies, systems, procedures that somehow accelerate and translate experiments, pilots, that they might have worked in a particular geography because of serendipity, because certain parties have met into scalable solution that the government can actually uh, promote and catalyze. What I find it extremely uh, frustrating as, as a social entrepreneur, as somebody who is active and talking to a lot of foundation philanthropies in government is that overall, Nonprofits, social entrepreneurs, and foundations don't really talk to governments, meaning they don't even try uh, to tackle uh, these obstacles. Obviously, there are exceptions, but the big question I think we should ask ourselves is why there is such a, a culturally entrenched resistance in the third sector 
to engage with, go to engage with government. I think much of it has to do with the past experience. We become a bit cynical. Is it really worth doing it? Politicians change every few years. Their administration is weak, is not only responsive. Is it really worth it? I think there is part of this. But there's much more. I think uh, the third sector is not necessarily professionalized enough to engage with governments in the same way big corporations do. They don't necessarily have the resources. Uh, because when you look historically at the role that philanthropy has played, in supporting advocacy, uh, you could see also the very same reticence. Uh, philanthropies don't like to promote advocacy. They don't like to become political, besides a few exceptions. And we all know this, uh, these foundations who are the exceptions, because sometimes they get in trouble uh, because of their politicization. So how can this change? Well, we live in a very politicized world. We see companies being forced to take a stand. We saw this uh, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We can expect that philanthropies, in order to become the kind of system change actors they pretend to be, they won't have a choice but, first of all, becoming themselves political actors by engaging more with governments, which doesn't mean electoral conversation. It's about talking, meeting, be facilitators, but also promoting more support and giving away grants in the long term that build the advocacy capacity of those organizations. There is a final obstacle, which is very methodological and which might resonate with many of you, which is how can philanthropies can develop a KPI measuring the success of a policy change, right? How can you prove a nexus, a causality between your effort as a nonprofit to push for a policy outcome and that outcome? It's very difficult, right? And this obstacle, uh, methodological one, has also been pushing back philanthropists because they say, well, how can we prove that? And I think that's a really wrong perspective because the question is not whether your grant has pushed for a progressive or less progressive policy outcome, but the question is to what extent you have built advocacy capacity in that particular organization. Has that organization asked the right question? Did they uh, define the stakeholder mapping in the right way? Did they advance their ability next time to be more successful on the policy outcome? This is a process, and the process oftentimes matters more than the outcome. And this kind of mindset is still very far apart from the average philanthropy across the world, I would say. Thank you so much, uh, Alberto, and thank you to the whole panel. I think we've recognized, and I'm just delighted that we've got to this moment of recognizing you know, the partnership of social entrepreneurship and philanthropy to meet business where business is and, and, and the needs that, that business have, uh, the needs that government have, but actually to be able to work together uh, on these kind of combined challenges that we all have, we all face in our own lifetimes, right? Uh, and so I just wanted to thank each of you. Please give them a great round of applause. Thank you. And I think we can, we can, we can stay seated here as I, as I invite uh, Professor Henri Peter to, to come and uh, 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 join us, uh, uh, and, and I just want to say one word, uh, first of all, thank you uh, uh, for the GCP for, I think, uh, as we would said, putting this on the agenda, but also recognizing how important the role academia has played in the evolution of social entrepreneurship over the last couple of decades, and I think of philanthropy and, of course, of sustainable finance, and it's a critical uh, uh, importance to have the center here in Geneva. We're delighted uh, to be part of this uh, in this partnership. Uh, and uh, thank you to your whole team, uh, Mara uh, and uh, Semia and Pauline and all of the others for putting today together. I'm not sure if you're going to thank them, but on my <laughs> behalf, uh, certainly thanks to, to you and the whole GCP team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois. Don't worry, I won't be long. I know it's late. Um, and I don't think there's much to add after this very high density inspiring event. Perhaps just two things. Um, why is that uh, part of the agenda of the Geneva Center for Philanthropy? Because we define philanthropy as being a voluntary contributing for the public good. And we think that uh, the entrepreneurs and enterprise and corporations have a key role to play. Philanthropy is 5% of GDP, but it's not only about quantity, it's about quality. And here we have high quality and, and, and probably we have means that can bridge uh, the gap between you know, uh, certain things that otherwise wouldn't happen. And this is why we decided to organize this event uh, tonight. Uh, part of this um, project is uh, our, our workshops going on today at university, tomorrow at the WEF uh, with, uh, with uh, Francois. Uh, it's a fantastic venture and a very inspiring event. Part of it is also a book 
which uh, we are going to uh, publish. It's going to be available in September uh, this year. Uh, with Springer, we have 44 contributions, the, the best three Actually, we could have, uh, you know, grand awards uh, this uh, prize to, to others. Been difficult call, but anyway, we have 44 excellent contributions uh, written by 71 uh, researchers and practitioners. It's, it is amazing, and I just want to quote the foreword that Professor Cohen Mayer very kindly wrote for us. This book is a testimony to the scale, significance, and scope of the social enterprise movement around the. Word. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say is thank you. Thank you to our rector, Yves Flückiger. Uh, thank you. He's, he's actually left because uh, he's got another event going on with a, a Nobel Prize here in this building. So uh, <laughs> he, he apologizes, but he'll be back later and join us. Uh, thank you to um, the um, Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship and, and Mrs. Schwab, we're really very uh, grateful for you to, to be here and, and, and Francois who is leading an outstanding team. This is an example of, of joint venture that uh, where each of us brings uh, what we have, our networks, ideas. We've been working on that for more than a year, I think. Um, well, it's been very inspiring for us. Um, thank you. Paul, uh, you're here. Thank you for your very inspiring speech. Where, you know, there's little to add after after you know listening to what you said. And thank you for the panel. Um, thank, you, thank you, you know, all of you for for being here um, and uh, taking part. Uh, this has been, I think, a, an event on which at least I learned a lot, and I, I'm going to get out of this room much more inspired, uh, with a better sense of my uh, mission. Uh, a better, bur a heavy burden, I must say, but uh, we'll try to do our best to contribute. Thank you, and have a nice uh, evening. Bye bye.